the first video in this series, we talked about the 12 tones of the Western scale. And we talked about the different colors or flavors that they make in relation to the chord being played. Now, as we begin to play over chord changes, this is where these colors begin to be combined and layered, making more complex and more beautiful hues exploding into an entire rainbow of colors that we can paint with. Let's start with a simple two chord loop, in this case a 1-5 progression in the key of C, and let's look at moving from the tonic of one chord to the tonic of the other. The tonic of the one and the tonic of the five chord hold a similar place in the scale because they both have two whole steps above them. In this case, the one, two, three of the scale and the five, six, seven. So we can use those tones to make some simple lick that moves back and forth looking like this. Now you notice that at the end we didn't move back to the exact note we started on, we climbed up from the five to the one on the same string. And then the five is once again one string below, allowing you to repeat the pattern. And you can do this several times. Patterns like this are super useful because they're not based on this being a C and a G chord, they're based on it being a 1 and a 5 chord. So once you figure out a little pattern like this that works, you can move it into any key you're playing in where you're playing over a 1-5 progression. For those of you that aren't familiar, these Roman numerals come from something called the Nashville number system, and they represent the different chords that are built off the different scale degrees of the major scale. The uppercase Roman numerals representing major chords and the lowercase ones representing minor chords with this funny little one at the end with the little circle representing a diminished chord. If you guys would be interested in me making a whole video that explains the Nashville number system and how all these chords are derived and why it all makes sense, let me know in the comments and I'll put that together for you. In the meantime, all that we really need to know is that understanding chord progressions in terms of their numbers is far more useful than understanding them just in terms of the names of the chords. If we understand the patterns of a 1-5 progression, we can move it into any key and the relationships to the scale around it, all the patterns, all the licks that we've learned will work no matter what. When Ed Sheeran said that he only uses four chords in his songs, he wasn't saying four particular chords, he meant he only uses the one, the five, the minor six, and the four. Some combination of these four chords makes up an absolutely ridiculous amount of modern rock and pop music. So if we learn these four chords and how they relate to each other and interlock, then the whole world of rock music begins to open up to us as a chordal soloist. Let's look again at this little climbing lick to understand how the colors begin to combine in order to make more complex and beautiful pictures. When we move from the tonic of the five chord up to the major third of the five chord here, that major third of the five chord is also the seventh of the one chord, only a half step away from the root. When we play in a key signature, the listener's ear becomes attached or accustomed to that key, and they now no longer hear the note only as the third of the five chord, which sounds very consonant and natural. They also hear it as the seventh of the root chord, only a half step away from the root, begging us, pulling us to resolve back to the one chord. Another great example of this is the flat seven of the five chord. If we look at the seventh chords built off of the different scale degrees of the major scale, we see that the five chord is a dominant chord, a major triad with a minor seventh on top. So when we play a flat seven on a five chord, it sounds still very bluesy and interesting, but also somehow correct with the chord. As opposed to if we play a flat seven on the one chord, where it's actually outside of the key signature, making it a true blues note. So this flat seven on the five chord is also the four of the root chord. It's only a half step away from the third, which is in the root chord. 
So now if we play a dominant seven chord on the five, we have two notes that are only a half step away from notes in the one chord. The third, which is a half step away from the one, and the flat seven, which is a half step away from the three. And this creates this dissonance, this pull. This is why you'll see a lot of bands and a lot of songwriters using the dominant seven on the five chord right before they go back to the one, because these two half steps pull us, just dragging us back for that resolution to the one. Now I know this starts to feel like a lot. The flat seven is the four of this other chord and the third is only a half step away from the one of the, it gets really confusing, but we have to remember that there's only seven chords in the major scale and only four of them make up the majority of pop music. So if we think of it in terms of the Roman numerals and we learn these four structures the whole world of pop music begins to open up to us as soloists, and it's really not that much information once you look at it in that way. Now, the only way to really learn this stuff is to go play around with it for yourself and just intuitively feel the way these different things work which is why I'm super excited about the backing tracks that I made for these videos for you guys, because they are the backing tracks that I wish I had when I was learning. As I mentioned in the first video, one of the hardest parts about soloing for me when I was learning was that I would just get lost. Like most people, when I was starting, I would just solo in the scale of the root key or in the minor pentatonic or the blues scale relative to that key and I would just solo in that scale regardless of what the chord changes were doing. And it was fun, I knew the scales really well so I could play fast and I could be flashy, but the big problem came when I would get lost in where I was in the progressions. I would get so excited about some melody that I was creating that I would just completely lose track of where I was and the train wreck would happen when I tried to end the solo. I would either play too long and the singer would come back in and I would still be wailing away on something, or I would end too early and there would be a couple bars where everyone in the band would stand there looking confused, waiting for the vocalist to come back in. I eventually started making these backing tracks for myself to practice with and I noticed that I would often look at the screen and see where the playhead was. So I started putting color coordinated markers that showed every chord change and then I could just glance very quickly. And this more than anything helped me to start internalizing the chord changes and being able to think melodically while still keeping track of where I was. So I made these backing tracks in order to try to emulate that experience for you guys. There's a metronome that shows the beats in each bar and then there's color coordinated blocks that move with the chord changes and then there's an eight measure progression bar. So if you guys wanna start working on longer musical phrasing like eight or 16 bar phrases, you'll also be able to keep track of that longer progression visually and hopefully seeing it visually while thinking melodically will help you start to be able to do these two things at the same time. Now, before we sign off, let's look real quickly at this four chord loop and talk about the third as a landing tone because this is where the third gets really interesting. The third is always a really beautiful place to land. It's the center of the root position triad. It has close harmony with the one and the five. But when you have a four chord progression that mixes major and minor chords, the third gets especially interesting because the third is what creates the difference between a major and a minor chord. A major chord has a major third on the bottom with a minor third on top, while a minor chord has a minor third on the bottom with a major third on top. The one and the five always stay the same and the three moves up and down. So when we express the three melodically during our solos, it helps the listener really feel those movements from major to minor and back again. When you hear professional guitarists talking about how they love to use the third soloing because it holds the most harmonic information, that's all that they're talking about. They're just saying that it expresses whether the chord is major or minor. In this four chord progression, it would sound like this. Thank you guys 
guys for watching. I hope you really enjoy playing with these backing tracks. I put a lot of work into them. If you haven't done so, hit the subscribe button, hit the like, and I will see you in the next episode of this series where we're going to talk about triads and how we can use triads to move up and down the neck and to put in some double stops and some more thickening and chordal feeling to our solos.